Good morning and welcome to Burniston Methodist Church Online. It's great to have you with us and to be all together as church family. Um, I hope you've had a good week. hope it's been okay. I'm just wondering how you're feeling now that um, they're starting to um, ease restrictions that the restrictions are being lifted. Just wondering how you're feeling. You may be um, like a caged animal that's can't wait to get out there into back into the wild again to be released. Or maybe you're a little more cautious. Maybe you're a bit fearful about venturing out into the world beyond your front door again. Well, whenever we face times of trial, the Lord tells us through scripture, do not be afraid. I am with you. God's promises are true throughout the Old and the New Testament and they're for today, for you and for me. God knows us and he loves us and he knows if we're a bit fearful in Isaiah 41, it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. So, do not fear. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. As we go into the service, let's just spend a moment to give thanks for the promises that he says. If he says he's going to be with us, he will. And we are thankful for that. So let's pray together. Thank you, dear Lord, that you are kind and you care about each one of us. You are great and you are mighty. And you promise to be with us. We acknowledge our fears before you, Lord. And we ask you to help us to be brave. And even a bit more daring as we venture out into life's new territories. You are our God and you promise to be with us. And we praise you. Amen. So... Take those promises on board and if you are afraid, let people know because we can always pray with you and pray for you. So enjoy the rest of the service and um, yeah, God bless you. Community is the thing that keeps the church together with a helping hand. Having fun together, a bunch of joy to celebrate Christ. Understand each other's troubles of peace, a place of peace. Really lovely people go to church, you should know. Community is the thing that keeps the church together with a helping hand. Hello, and today we are going to be making a prayer station. You will need some paper, pens, envelope, so you can watch me make it.
we're going to do an experiment to find out what really happens when we pray. OK, so you need to follow the instructions. So I want you to pour some water from the jug in your glasses. Oh, the jug, right. This fizzy water? No, that's just n tap water. So about a third of the glass, maybe? Yeah, tell me A bit more. Yeah, a bit more. Probably enough. Yes. Have them. Okay. Maybe a bit less than that. Yeah, right. Not too important. Mm. Okay, and then you can start putting some fizzy water in, Toby. Mm. Can you manage it? Yeah. It's quite a big bottle. Mm. Look what you do. No, that's it. Well done. Okay. All the way to the top, right? No, not all the way to the top, just yeah. maybe. What are you? That looks yummy. Do a bit more. Mm, it does. And then pass it on to Madeline. Bubbles. Can you do it? Yeah. You might want to stand up. I know the bubbles fizzing. That's... Thank you, Toby. Just yeah. It's <laughs> rainbow coming through. Right. There you go. Claire. Claire. Thank Just God. hold right. that. I think you can do One. it. It's hard. Do you want some help? Yeah. I want to drink it. You won't want to drink it when the tablet's going. Yeah, no. That's the 16. Okay, there we are. Yeah. Right. Let's just put the lid back on. Oh, it's mm. tablet okay, so you can have um, yellow, or you can have pink, or you can have green, or blue, or you can have clear water. Blue. Pink, please. Okay, so. Pink, you want please. pink. Would you only need a very small amount? How do you know that was coming, Maddie? I'd like blue. <laughs> My favourite colour is pink. That's fine. Good to prepare this. Right, so you're having pink, are you, Madeline? Yeah, Madeline? I am. And I'm having blue. Doesn't look like pink. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's already a shooting star. It's a bit. So satisfying. I know. It's like a shooting star. I know. Give it a bit of a stir. Yes, Mum. So you two are both having blue, are you? Yeah. yeah. <gasps> are you right? Yeah, just cut my finger. <laughs> Is it hurting? Is it bleeding? Mm. Wow, that's cool. Thank you, Mummy. You don't have to be. Okay, pass it to... Is it ready? Yep. That's I'd like brilliant. to have it after Toby. That looks please. delicious. They look like shooting stars when it goes in. Yeah, yeah. Just give it a stir. Oh, it's got a whirlpool. No, like a... They've got a whirlpool. Is it all blue? Okay, pass it on them. Look at mine. It looks so good. I know. Blue, pink, blue. Yeah, pattern. Go on, drink it. It looks so nice. Yeah, I know. It's a whirlpool there. Okay. I don't think I got a whirlpool. You would have done. That's it. That's enough. Okay, so I'm going to give you an Alka Seltzer tablet. And you mustn't drink this water. I won't. Because it's got medicine in it, okay? And I want you to tell me, I want you to watch it, and I want you to tell me how you feel when you watch it. Wow. Whoa, Whoa. that is really That's cool. cool. I know. It's like pulling at the bubbles. Yeah, it's cool. It makes me feel relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> Is it exciting to yeah, watch? Yeah. yeah. Really exciting. All the writing's gone off so a bit. So cool. Want to put another one in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter. And in minutes it'll be gone. I know it will. And then what you want to do, girls? Nah. Look. I'm fine. Stop fizzing. What can you hear? Fizz, fizz, fizz. fizz. So it's quite exciting to watch, isn't it? Yeah. Every time we pray to God, this that happens. is how Jesus feels. Because you're building a relationship with him and you're relying on him. But sometimes we need to stop and listen. That's really cool. I know. So we have to listen to Jesus Not too close. when we pray. Cheers, but Cheers. don't drink. Cheers, Cheers, but don't, don't drink. drink it. Cheers, fingers. Pray, pray, pray. I love to pray. I can talk to God about anything. Pray, pray. I love to pray. I can talk to God anywhere. Pray, pray. I love to pray. I can talk to God about sports. Pray, pray. I love to pray. I can talk to God about schoolwork, maths, English, science, 
simply anything, football, tennis, gymnastics, simply anything, worry, sickness, nerves, simply anything, exams, music, drama, simply anything, God will listen in, there's no doubt about that, and even if you're lucky, he may talk back, it may not be how you expect it, might not be a form of a voice, but you will know if he does, and it will feel good. Prayer. Prayer is where you talk to God, read the Bible to learn more. All you do is talk to him. Year to year you pray all the time, even when it's bedtime. Read God's word and you'll be better. Hello. Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 4 verses 23 to 31, the Believer's Prayer. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servants, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Good morning everybody, we're uh, continuing our new series on prayers from the Bible. David started last week with uh, a sermon on the Lord's Prayer uh, and my sermon today is on the prayer of the believers in Acts chapter 4. It's actually entitled The Believer's Prayer, uh, it's subtitled in that way in many Bibles and it's a prayer um, it's a prayer really for, for boldness and courage in the face of opposition and adversity from the powers that be. And it's useful to look at it. You might like to have your Bibles open whilst we're doing this um, in the context of how it came about. So if you look at Acts chapter 3 and the first part of Acts chapter 4, you'll see that it follows on from uh, a good deed that Peter and John did in those chapters. They were going up to the temple to worship. And whilst doing so, they met a lame beggar at the beautiful gate and um, he hoped to get some money from them. But Peter and John didn't have any. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have a gift to you. It took him by the hand and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man did so. And he didn't just walk. He was leaping and jumping and praising God. And it attracted a great crowd in the temple uh, and Peter took the opportunity to preach to the people who gathered around to explain to them uh, brothers don't be surprised at this happening don't think it's been done in our own strength but it's been done uh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and um, so powerful was the preaching and so full of the Holy Spirit coupled with this remarkable miracle that had been performed um, that the number of believers increased from 3,000 
which is the number at the end of the Pentecost um, session that Pam preached on last uh, the week before last, it now grew to uh, about 5,000. In fact, it may well have been double that because it says it grew to 5,000 men. There were no doubt women and children as well. But the thing is that there was instant opposition. This is the first time uh, the church had been going along swimmingly, uh, but wherever um, the Lord's work is being done, there will be opposition. My father-in-law used to say, the devil won't rock a boat unless it's going somewhere. And uh, the boat certainly was going somewhere uh, with all these people being converted. And so um, the powers that be appeared on the scene, had Peter and John arrested and um, put into prison overnight, which must have fairly well shaken them up. Laura and I, as many of you know, had an experience of being locked up uh, last December. We'd gone on an errand of mercy. Um, Laura had filled the roof box of our car with, um, or the car we were driving, it was her car actually, uh, full of woolen goods to be able to take to uh, the refugees camped out in near freezing conditions uh, in the industrial wasteland around the perimeter of Calais. And uh, we felt it was our Christian calling to do this. We were two representatives, uh, as it happens, from Burniston Chapel of a group of five. And uh, we went there and did our bit and took money to buy food, worked in the uh, refugee community kitchen for three days. And then on the way back, we arrived at Passport Control and um, were uh, apprehended by the British Border Force when a stowaway was found in our roof box. Um, we were then arrested by the French police and taken to Calais Police Station where we spent the whole day uh, to a certain extent in, I suppose it was fear and trepidation. We wondered what on earth was going to happen. We'd been told that uh, we could face a year imprisonment for the first offence. It, it would be six years if we ever did it again. Uh, so we knew it was serious stuff and we were praying that the Lord would somehow uh, release us from the predicament we'd got into through, as we saw it, trying to do a good deed, our Christian calling to um, people who were in a fairly parlous situation. And um, at one point I was placed in a safe area beside uh, a poster where it said, there is no God, there is no Satan, take responsibility for your own actions. I still kept on praying. And uh, mercifully, at the end of it all, we were released without charge and the British Border Police were quite surprised that that had happened. Um, clearly, uh, the authorities did not have much sympathy for the refugees uh, and we were told that we were responsible for not having locks on the roof box and not having checked the roof box. But thank the Lord we arrived back in England safe and sound, at least without being incarcerated. But it did give us a little insight of... Um, what it's like to, to be doing what you believe to be God's will, but to find yourself in conflicts with the authorities, just a taste perhaps of what um, Peter and John experienced being put in prison overnight. So that's what happened to them. And then the following day, they were brought before the court, the Sanhedrin, uh, where they were subjected to quite close questioning by the authorities. And Peter, you remember, was... But he was completely floored by the question of a servant girl a few weeks earlier asking if he belonged to Jesus and Peter of course denied it. So it's remarkable and on this occasion before the highest court in the land he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he speaks to them so plainly and so directly and uh, this is what he says it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They don't like it. They order them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus, and they threaten them um, before finally letting them go. Uh, they've really no reason to hold them any longer. Uh, and in fact, um, clearly a remarkable miracle has occurred and the people are rejoicing because of that. And it's very sad that the religious leaders themselves appear to have been quite unmoved by that. So that's the setting. That's what happened. And the first thing that we come to in verse 23 is um, Peter and John going straight back, we're told, to their own people. In other words, to the church, the body of believers, and to report back what's happened. 
They will have been quite shaken up by the experience, just as Laura and uh, I and the other girls were in Calais, uh, but they didn't bottle it up to themselves, they shared it. And it's often said that a problem shared is a problem halved. And if you, um, I think this is the first lesson really, if you have um, something that's really getting you down, share it with other people, a trusted member of your own family or a trusted friend or better still, uh, a trusted Christian friend, because um, the problem is not only halved, if we share it with a Christian friend, we're bringing God into the equation and that's uh, a totally different dimension and it puts an entirely different complexion on the situation and that's what happens here. Uh, God being brought into the equation, the early church pray um, about what's happened and the believers raise their voices in prayer to the Lord and what a prayer it is. So we continue with verse 24. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And they go on to basically praise and thank God for his creative power, the fact that he created the universe, uh, created the earth and all the beauty around them. And we also can get great inspiration from doing that. We often start our prayers uh, in a normal Sunday service with prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And um, that of itself often lifts you up. Um, if you don't know how to pray or you don't feel like praying, it's often good to pray one of the psalms of praise, something like the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And just by doing that, or just by going for a walk in country and seeing the beauty of nature all around us, it lifts us up. So they start off by doing that, praising God for his power, who he is and what he's done. They then go on um, in verse 25 and verse 26 to remind themselves that what is happening is to be expected and that God actually is in control. However appalling a situation may be, God is in control. And they remind themselves of uh, prophecy in scripture. Uh, in Psalm 2 verses 1 and 2, it's actually a psalm of King David, but it's a prophetic one. And it's the one that starts off uh, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed one. And they can see that that was prophesied a thousand years before, uh, but it's exactly what's happening now. And it endorses that God is in control. The very people, sadly, who knew the law, who knew the prophets, religious leaders, lawyers they seem blind to the old testament scriptures and blind indeed to the miracle that's taking place it's interesting that in matthew chapter 23 um, jesus uh, says this he says to them woe to you pharisees hypocrites blind guides and they were indeed hypocrites because as the prayer goes on it, re it rehearses the fact that um they, although they hated the Romans and they hated King Herod, they conspired together with them. They hated the Romans because, of course, they were the Gentile occupying force to whom they were subject. Um, they despised King Herod because he was a puppet king placed in charge of them by the Romans. And yet they're reminding themselves that the Jewish leaders conspired with those very people in order to rid themselves of Jesus and have him killed, the very person who was their Lord and their Messiah, a long-awaited Messiah, if only they'd taken heed of the scriptures that they were supposed to know so well. If you know Handel's Messiah, the great oratorio, there is a, a song in there, I think towards the end, Why do the nations rage against the Lord and his anointed? And it's something that we do need to learn from the lessons of the past to make sure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated um, in the future and indeed in the present. There has been opposition and sometimes, sadly, it's come from the church. William Tyndale, the person who translated the Bible into English, um, he eventually was executed by the church for doing that. So. We do sadly have to expect that there will be opposition and things will conspire against us. But nonetheless, 
we, as William Tyndale did, need to continue to do what is the Lord's will and to, to obey his laws. Um, it is possible today, particularly living in a culture that doesn't want to acknowledge God and uh, sometimes we ourselves can be blind to the, the voice of the scriptures when the voices of secularism and political correctness can be so loud and so demanding. Why do people today um, despise the name of Jesus? Why do people get really annoyed when Christians um, do what the Bible says? Um, it is as if the, the world is still conspiring against the Lord and his anointed one. So obviously we can respond to that by doing what those voices demand. In other words, bowing down and doing what they say and uh, doing what everybody else is doing and going with the flow. But of course, it's not the Christian way. It's certainly not the way of Jesus. Jesus was distinctive. And Peter and John and the other disciples were all distinctive. They went against the flow. They did what the Lord said, said rather than what the, the um, powers that be were saying. So that's what we need to do. And uh, I was thinking about it particularly in uh, recent weeks. A lot of you have been enjoying watching The Chosen, the new film that's come out fairly recently. Interestingly, during the coronavirus and the pandemic, I found it a great inspiration and encouragement amidst all the uncertainty and fear that the pandemic has thrown up. And um, it's a very interesting uh, film. It's a series uh, in eight parts so far, and it's completely crowdfunded, uh, not at all what Hollywood uh, would want. Um, and, um, and yet it's been a, a worldwide instant hit on, of all things, YouTube, um, including people from other nations, other cultures, other religions. Uh, people have been become Christians by watching um, The Chosen. It's about the call of the disciples and um, the emblem of the uh, Chosen is uh, hopefully showing on a, a slide in front of you now. It's the, uh, the emblem of the 13 fish signifying Jesus and the disciples swimming against the tide, against the flow of all the other fish. Um, and that's what Jesus did. He, he went against the flow. He did things differently. And um, in a way, the uh, director and the team who produced The Chosen have done that. It's been a question of the director putting his reputation on the line, probably putting uh, his finances on the line as well, relying on it being produced by crowdfunding. But that has produced the first eight episodes. Do watch them if you haven't already done so. The, they are most inspiring. So uh, what does it tell us about Peter and uh, John and the early church? Well, certainly um, they didn't um, bow down and um, kowtow, as it were, to the, the, the forces of fear and opposition and discouragement that the devil uh, was uh, throwing at them. And um, they uh, performed healings and miracles. They um, preached in the name of Jesus, the, the, the salvation of the Lord everywhere in his name. And um, they didn't do what the powers that killed Jesus wanted them to. Instead, they affirm in their prayer, and this is verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In other words, God is still in control. He didn't make it happen. He didn't want Jesus to be crucified, but he knew the fickle heart of man and our faithlessness. And um, he knew because he's omniscient, all knowing that it would happen. Indeed, indeed, it was foretold by the prophets long before that the Messiah would be uh, a suffering servant, um, the suffering servant um, part of, of Isaiah 53 that we know very well, that's often read at Christmas, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the punishment that we deserve was all 
laid on him and by his wounds we are healed and all this came true in um, in Jesus and his crucifixion he he suffered the punishment that, uh, that brought us peace it was on him and by his wounds we are healed so when we do face opposition and threats and it can take all sorts of different forms we need to take a leaf out of the early church's book and remind ourselves that the Lord is in control even so even though many times it doesn't seem like it especially in the midst of a pandemic as we are at the moment and um, we can feel dreadful for all sorts of reasons uh, Christian theology talks about the unholy trinity of the the world the flesh and the devil and that can take all sorts of forms to make us feel dreadful I was um, looking at Pilgrim's Progress you remember how Christian the hero in Pilgrim's Progress um, was making his way up the, uh, the narrow path of life towards heaven and at one point he gets sidetracked and end, ends up in the clutches of giant despair and in Doubting Castle and he has a terrible time of it, gets beaten up, he's tempted to commit suicide because things are so dreadful, giant despair is saying why don't you just give up, why don't you just put an end to it, it's never going to get any better and uh, Christian is tempted to do that but then he remembers the promises of Jesus and it says that he pulls them out of his bosom and applies them and finds that they are the key that opened the doors of Doubting Castle and its gate and although he's pursued by giant despair um, he escapes together with his companion hope, hopefulness and they get back onto the narrow uphill path that ultimately leads them to the heavenly city to heaven uh, to the new Jerusalem so um, it's a point it's a question really of looking not at the giants um, not at the problem not at the coronavirus or whatever other opposition or dreadful thing there is that's facing us at the moment not to look at those things but rather to as the old song says to turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and this is what the early church are doing in this prayer we come to in a sense the climax of the prayer in uh, verses 29 and 30 now Lord consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus it's interesting isn't it that they aren't put off by what the authorities do they must have been shaken by it but um, they don't even ask the Lord to take away the problem they just pray Lord give us courage and give us boldness to do your will and to do in effect the right thing uh, Paul says in uh, in Philippians 4 verse 13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and so can we if we place our trust and our faith in him and look to him the solution to our problems and not at the giants of the problems themselves and so we conclude um, with verse 31 the last verse of this section it says after they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And I want to conclude with something that happened to me 30 years ago. We're on the subject of prayers in the Bible, prayer being a really important thing in our Christian lives. And I've been rereading this prayer diary that I kept in, in 1990. And I found this little passage um, for the 26th of April 1919 it just says this this evening Eleanor that's my mother in my late mother-in-law Eleanor and I went off to the circuit fellowship meeting only to find it wasn't on we ended up at the Anfields the Anfields were a retired uh, Methodist minister and his wife who were full of the Holy Spirit incidentally we ended up at the Anfields where we spent two hours in fellowship and prayer with them and both felt quite uplifted. In fact, the presence of the Holy Spirit was so powerful during the prayers that it felt like 
not just a presence, but a gentle but forceful movement. Afterwards, when I turned to look at Mary's mum, she looked the same as she did in hospital after her miraculous leg operation six years ago, like the face of a young girl. And just to put that in context, my mother-in-law had cancer at the age of 61 at the top of her leg. They said that her leg may well have to be removed or that she may not be able to uh, walk again, but against all expectations. And in the light of the prayers of the Anglican Church in Nottingham, they, they visited many, many people praying for her. And also the skill of a Christian surgeon at the hospital. Um, she not only uh, didn't lose a leg, but uh, they completely removed the cancer and she was able to do 14 mile walks down the Cleveland Way um, in the months eventually uh, that uh, followed on from that. So it was a remarkable um, story of healing and I remember seeing her in hospital in Nottingham and her face just being like the face of a young girl I can't describe it any other way and then on this meeting during this prayer meeting at the Anfield seeing Eleanor at the end of it and her face again looked like the face of a young girl it was glowing and I can only put that down to the power of the Holy Spirit in that room and in that place on both those occasions, surrounded by the powerful prayers of the saints um, for what was going on. So I want to conclude with some words from Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14. And it just simply says this, is anything too hard for the Lord? Thank you, Paul, for our preaching this morning. And now we come to a time of prayer. Prayer for others, for ourselves, for the church. So let's pray. Amazing God, our Bible reading today reminds us that Peter and John were imprisoned for their faith, just for talking about Jesus. So let us pray for many Christians imprisoned for their faith. O oh Lord, we're horrified that recent statistics show that more Christians are in prison for their beliefs than for any other faith. Not only imprisoned, but often tortured, and yes, sometimes even crucified. Lord, we pray, fill them with courage, even the awful situation they find themselves in. Pour new compassion into the hearts of their jailers, and we pray, as soon as possible, set them free. Lord, we remind, remember too that when Peter and John were brought from prison to stand before the authorities, they spoke out, boldly, challenging the status quo. Lord, we want to do that too. We want to pray against the racism still encountered in our world. We're saddened by the events surrounding the death of George Floyd, but even more saddened that the issue of discrimination on grounds of colour, race, faith or background is still prevalent. Lord, I pray that the urge within us to respond in anger might be channelled into a powerful movement for change. For Jesus, we praise you because you died on a cross for black and white, Slave and free, rich and poor, male and female, because your radical love made no distinction. O oh Lord, help the world to see each human being as equally important. Let us not rest until equality is achieved. And Lord, as we think again about lockdown, we know that so many have struggled in different ways. Some have coped, some have been filled with fear, some have struggled with strained relationships, some with increased violence and abuse, some with increased addiction, and some young children have become solo carers for single parents without the outside support 
they can usually count on. Lord, give them all the courage and the stamina they need just to keep going until the lockdown is eased a little. Give us eyes to see, Lord, where we might help. Now, yes, in practical ways, if there's something we can do while still staying safe. But also when lockdown is over, let us see how the church might be more effective in helping and supporting neighbours in need. So now we come to our time of strategic prayer. It simply means we're focusing on how folks at Burniston Methodist Church can try to be a little more like Jesus. Lord, help us find new courage to share with others where it is we find hope and belief and trust. For we find it all through knowing Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. Inspire us to speak to people in the family, workmates, friends and neighbours, perhaps online, perhaps while we're Zooming, perhaps waiting till we're face to face again. And finally, Lord, we pray about our church organisations where we love engaging with others. At Burniston, We think particularly about the coffee stop, where sharing with homemade cakes and coffee, we invite not only locals to come and join us, but also friends with learning difficulties and their carers. Lord, we pray, keep us loving, warm and welcoming. We think too of the activities for youngsters, toddler group, the bubbles group, Messy Church, the Boys' Brigade. O Lord, keep us creative and imaginative, doing your work and showing your love. We think too, Lord, of the teenager groups, of the bus stop, rock club, Faith in Scarborough Schools, South Africa Rebuild Team. And Lord, we pray, keep that spark burning brightly that is already aflame in each young life. But we must also remember those who work tirelessly from our church with refugees, the Rainbow Centre, Sidewalk, and of course, the craft groups. Lord, we pray, continue keeping us ready and willing. For Lord, in all those groups, we long to be faithful to you, to share our love of Jesus with others, to foster that that spark of faith that there already exists in others. So Lord, if we need to change or expand any of the groups in any way, please show us, Lord, make it clear so we know how we can do your work more effectively. And Lord, if you know that we need others to help, then raise up new people to work alongside us. One, maybe two, so that in some way we can reach out to others even more effectively with the good news and love of Jesus. So Lord, fill us again with your love, your vision, your strength, your commitment and your power. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So thank you for joining us today in this act of worship. And until we meet again, keep safe and God bless you.